Are we ready, team? Well, good afternoon. I'm Colonel John Cyrillic. I'm the Director of Evaluation and Standardization at Fort Rucker, Alabama, the United States Army Aviation Center of Excellence. And I'm fortunate to lead our Army, tra Army Training and Leader Development deep dive this afternoon. We're going to focus on the Operational Army. We have a lot of distinguished guests here. I know that you know five of my peers and I have been collaborating uh, on and off over the past couple of weeks to prepare a variety of subtopics that may help us guide our discussion. First, I, I do want to thank Quad A. You know, this is any time we spend talking about Army training and developing leaders is time very well spent. And so I, I appreciate the support here, the room, the infrastructure. It's been a fantastic day. I have learned a lot already. I'm sure I will learn here as your moderator this afternoon. I know there's two other deep dives that follow us. So we're going to break somewhere around 1545 to 1550 to allow us to take care of business at home station quickly or take a break and then move over to discuss the National Guard aviation and manned and unmanned teaming in the rooms right down the hall. So without further ado, I'd like to, I'd like to propose we potentially focus on five areas. First, unit training management. I will tell you as a director that one of the things I have observed while assessing and observing and assisting aviation units worldwide is a general need for us to improve our training management. Second, leveraging our aviation TADS devices, simulators, and simulation. And we have the director of simulation here with us from Fort Rucker, which will help as we shape that discussion. Air ground operations training at home station. We have a representative from JRTC. A lot of us have been involved in that type of training. Recently deployed commanders, serving combat aviation brigade commanders here with us that may be able to help as we uh, form ideas and best practices. Aviation TCT, CTC training and requirements and way ahead. You know, I, I, I have had uh, discussions with both Colonel Ryan and Colonel Riley about what's happening out there at the CTCs, and I know we attempt to stay in touch with that from Fort Rucker. And then, you know, just generally developing leaders to be adaptive and resilient. And, you know, Colonel Vazari here from the 166, always certifying leaders as they move on the pre-deployment course and move to Kuwait or Afghanistan and previously to Iraq and, and, and Sergeant Major. You know, uh, Colonel Baker here from the Department or Directorate of Training and Doctrine at Fort Rucker. You know, he is knee deep in all of these subject areas. So, uh, and of course, General Lundy, thank you for participating. And without further ado, let's, let's I, I'll just go with a subject and then I'll look forward to your feedback. All I'd ask is, as we begin to dive deeply, I'll hand you the microphone. The gentleman in the back will turn it on. Go ahead and introduce yourself briefly, who you are, your rank, and where you're currently serving so that we get a sense of your perspective as we talk about training for the future and developing adaptive leaders. So training management, unit training management. So is there anybody that'd like to just chew on unit training management? Or I can offer some thoughts. Sir, was there a hand? How about Colonel Baker? How about you tell us where we stand you know, some of the governing documents and processes we have out there to help units manage training. Are we live? Okay, thank you. Yeah, hi, my name's Colonel Jim Baker. I'm the Director of Training Doctrine at Fort Rucker. Um, I, let me just start by saying the, uh, within the last week, uh, we, we got some guidance, sir, when, when you went over and looked at the PCC. I'll start there because I think that's a critical component of this. As we move to an army of preparation and realizing we don't have a generation of officers and we don't have a generation of non-commissioned officers really that have grown up doing training management like we did. We've had a lot of OMA funds to go out and fly helicopters and do things that we're not going to be able to do now. Um, so we're addressing this unit training management thing in several ways. CACT, I know, has got a team on the road right now, an MTT that's going out trying to address captain's career courses. Uh, 
directorates of training and doctrine at the, di at the different COEs on training management, training to do training management in units. So we get after that cohort of leaders that we're, we're generating now and particularly the captain's career course on how to do this, but where they get the resources to understand how to develop a unit training plan uh, and so forth. So what I would tell you is um, one of the critical things we've got to get inculcated in this generation of leaders is understand from start to finish, understand how to take a brigade medal and neck it down to key critical collective tasks that you're going to train. We don't have resources to train everything. We certainly don't have resources to fly everything we're going to do. So I, we'll get into, I'm sure we'll talk at some point about live virtual constructive gaming and, and how you use that to leverage uh, tools to get after this. But point is, how you neck down a, a brigade medal to a battalion, to a company, key critical training tasks that you're going to focus on and develop. You got to understand how to do that. You also got to understand what the resources are that are available. You got to understand the TSS system and what's out there at home station, whether you're going to train live, virtual, constructive, or gaming. Um, where those things are laid out in a boilerplate to help you develop a training plan or combined arms training strategies. There's 52 of them, one for every kind of company we have in the aviation force that lay out iterative events of live, virtual, constructive, and gaming, how we train our units. Um, all that is important, but maybe more important than any of it is now giving this, this cohort of leaders the perspective of time and, and planning. Because to be able to leverage all those things, you have to backwards plan in time. And we haven't had to do that in a way that we're going to have to in the future, not for the last decade. So those are critical things, I think, understanding unit training management, uh, how you get down to what the critical things I'm going to focus on that I need to do for my unit to get to whatever T, T rating I need to get to. And not everybody's going to, going to have to get to T1 or be resourced to get there. But those commanders, company level, battalion level commanders, that understand the bigger picture, what resources are available, and the time it takes and the planning required to get after building a, a solid training plan of the ones that are going to succeed. So I hope that begins to answer some of the questions. Sir. Hey, for the, for the commanders out there, I mean, I've got some ideas. I can get up here and espouse all kinds of stuff. But from commanders, some of our chief warrant officers, our non-commissioned officers, what are the gaps and the challenges you're facing at home station with your leaders at what level with respect to just training in general and training management? And then are you, do you have any TTPs or what are you doing at your level to kind of close those gaps? You know, we've talked a little bit about what we're doing and I want to hear what you're doing. And then maybe there's some things that we need to be doing more at the institution. Excellent. I'll jump on the mic. Uh, Colonel John Klein, Commander 3rd Cab. Uh, you know, one of the things we found is that, uh, you know, you look at the population of those individuals that quote unquote know how to train, and really the last generation before 9-11 that kind of went through a routine basis of doing QTBs were those officers that were company commanders prior to 9-11, and on the NCO side, there were very few that were first sergeants before 9-11, before and it's at that first building block that you see those individuals develop a strategy where they define their medal, their mission essential task list, look where they want to be in a quarter, and then are able to articulate that strategy on how they're going to get from A to B. And for so long now, we have been pushing that information top down. The R4 Gen cycle has been such that we know exactly what we got to do in the 13 months we have in between a, a rotation. So you're going to go to Hatch, you're going to go to the CTC rotations, whatever the case may be, and these big boulders form up on the calendar and a company commander is in execution mode and he's lost that art on how to develop a training plan at his level. And you can res start resourcing it at a higher level. Within our own footprint, we have reinstituted the QTB, the quarterly training brief. And what it's taken to get to that level, though, it's taking battalion, me to battalion commanders and then battalion commanders to company commanders to do an actual OPD, an officer professional development, to describe how that works and everything that goes with that. And for some of the older folks in the room, that you would, you know, you, you, that's what you grew up with. At the end of the day, you go to a quarterly training brief, and a brigade commander gave you the thumbs up or a thumbs down, and he approved your training plan. Well, that's that was somewhat foreign to our company commanders, and I would imagine that's going on throughout many cabs. I'm probably, I'm hoping I'm not the only one out there, but that's where we're at right now in our training development program. And then after they have that, whatever that is, that that kind of capstone event that they're going to 
uh, an FTX, it could be a, a convoy live fire, whatever the case may be, to further deep dive into that and say, okay, look at all of my sergeant's time training that are going to take place between now and then and have some sort of continuity that makes sense in terms of what are we going to accomplish till we can get to that final end state of whatever collective training that event that is. It's also okay to not necessarily hit the T. In some cases, they're just trying to sustain a P. And in some cases, they may articulate a strategy where they're going to go from a P to a U because of they're going to have a massive personal turnover, or whatever the case may be. And that's okay, because some of these young company commanders just feel like they're compelled. I'm going to be a U, and then next quarter I'm going to be a T, and, and may, that may not be the case. Anybody else? Any, any other comments there? Wheeler, hold that for me. Okay. So, you know, I, I'm interested, commanders, command chief warrant officers, former battalion commanders, uh, e even our industry partners, you know, how elementary was, maybe Colonel Klein, you can help me here, or any of the other team members, how elementary was the formal education in training management? So w were you speaking complete foreign language to these young men and women? Or, 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 or you know, how were we doing? Maybe, maybe I, I know we're going to focus on the operational learning, but at some point, you know, we have to get everyone, you know, baselined in the language of training management, you know, in the Army Training Network. And, and you know all those resources available, and and I'm, and I, I would love to get a sense from leaders, in, in, in maybe from your perspective, Kevin, you know, from the reserve components of where we stand with the knowledge of training management. Okay, good. I think one of the you know we're kind of in this turbulent period right now. I mean, at PCC, if we look at brigade commanders who came through PCC, all of you that are sitting in here right now, and battalion commanders, if it hadn't been very recently, you probably did not get a lot of unit training management as part of the PCC course. That's recently been corrected. So here's what I would also tell you to think about, is do you understand our doctrine? Okay, have you really, because it's not the same doctrine that was 11 years ago, 12 years ago. So that that's important. That's being communicated now at Leavenworth. I used to personally go spend couple hours with the commanders and that's what we're bringing into the institution right now because we do have to get our captains reblued. we've got to bring it into our warrant officer uh, advanced course so I would tell you that you need to take a look at that and make sure you understand the doctrine and there's unit training management handbook out there for commanders just released early this year you need to probably take a look at that because what you're gonna get is you're gonna get a captain who's gonna show up that's gonna understand it and maybe you aren't using the same doctrinal language that he is so We've got to, that's the way it normally is when we release new doctrine and other things like that. Worst thing you can do is during combat change your doctrine. And guess what we did? We did. So we kind of lost sight of, you know, and, and the changes make sense. I mean, what it did, our training management doctrine now aligns with our, our operational doctrine. I mean, it uses the operations process to drive training. So you, you develop an, an op order. You know, it's not and that becomes your unit training plan. So we did away with short-term calendars and long-term calendars. You're, bu you're building a plan, and you use the MDMP to do it. And there's a place in there where commanders are inserted and they get involved in it. So that, that's probably first and foremost is you've got to look in your formations out there and do you get everybody on the same sheet of music, so from a professional development perspective. And then getting more into how do you get after understanding your environment? Because what's the most, you know, the first thing that we do when we find out where we're deploying as we do a PDSS. And what are we doing on that PDSS? We're going over there to learn the environment. Well, how many of you have done a PDSS at your home station? Have you taken them to your mission training complex? Have you walked ranges with your done toots with all your leaders and said, here's how we shoot gunnery, guys. This is what I expect on a small arms range. This is the standard I expect on how we're going to do combat lifesaver when we're doing a convoy live fire. That's all free, cheap training that you can train your leaders so they can better understand. So I'd, I just, you know, to open the aperture up a little bit, I kind of wanted to do that because training management is more than just that, you know, going through a briefing process or understanding the relationship of metal to key collective tasks or understanding combined arms training strategies. Those are all important components of it, but it is about the application. So it, it's kind of, as you think about, you can, you can read doctrine, but if you don't ever go out and, and physically, you know, execute, and that's what we need to be thinking about. How do we physically execute the training piece? What are those components out there that we have to pull together so our leaders better understand that? Uh, and that's kind of what I'm interested in hearing. But, oh, okay. Thank you, sir.
you know, no, I think that's a, a, a and, and unless there's a, anybody burning with a thought on that subject, I think that segues well into the next subtop subtopic, which is leveraging TADS. Okay, so we, we talked about broadening aperture and, you know, all getting our doctrinal basis correct, using the proper terms, you know, you know, at some point us as the leaders, training subordinates and how we are going to execute training management akin to the operations process. And then, you, you know, at some point we're training. So and, and, and an important part of our business and, you know, a lot of industry leaders here is, is occurs with simulation. And, and so, you know, how are we leveraging? I, I've seen some very good ideas. In fact, one of the commanders that's here now, I, I know uh, is taking advantage of the simulators in particular at his home station. I know you've seen it. So maybe you could give us, as the director of simulation, an overview on where we stand with simulation as it involves Army tra our training, our operational units, and then we'll talk about some of those things we see with Colonel Vazari and, and maybe Colonel Klein, the work that you're doing, uh, particularly in the AVCAD as it comes to training leaders at your home station, that you emphasize where we were at our recent visit there. Noon, I'm give, give him one second. Yep. Okay. I'm Colonel Steve Seitz, the Director of Simulation for USACE. And uh, a lot of the early points I wanted to make were just made in the last segment, but just to put it in a little bit different perspective, as General Barkley mentioned, uh, sometimes we need to blow the dust off of things that we used to do well and uh, figure out how to do them again. And that's where we are uh, to a large degree with training for the reasons I already mentioned. Ten years of war. Uh, R4 Gen, uh, and when trainers were evaluated by, or, or where leaders were evaluated by their ability to successfully participate in training as opposed to devise and implement and uh, conduct training. So we need to go back and uh, relearn that uh, skills that have atrophied over time, and they've been complicated by the fact that over 10 years we've had an increase in technology. So we have a lot of tools that are now available that our, that our mid to senior grade leaders weren't familiar with when they were young leaders. So uh, when, you, when you bring in all the new TADs, uh, a lot of simulators that didn't exist, or a lot of capabilities that didn't exist, or capabilities that existed which are much better today. Um, an example is uh, AppCap, for example, has had a lot of recent upgrades that some people may not be familiar with. Part of the reason that trainers aren't, uh, that are young, our young officers aren't, aren't uh, very well versed in training is because we're not doing a real good job, I think, in our IMT and PME of teaching them what all these tools are and how to use them. We've been working on that over the last uh, year or so, but there's still uh, a lot of progress that needs to be made. But for example, we've recently started uh, having a culminating aviation leadership exercise uh, right at the end of flight school. So the last thing they do before they get their wings is participate in a collective training exercise. So they're going beyond what they just learned with their IP in the cockpit to figure out how they're going to integrate into the force uh, with uh, other types of aircraft in particular. So uh, uh, I think that's an important thing. Other ways we're trying to help educate the force uh, at Fort Rucker is the Aviation Mission Survivability, or AMSO, Aviation Mission Survivability Officers course. It used to be the TAC Ops course. We're also introducing them to the new uh, aviation survivability equipment capabilities in the AVCAT. Some of them may not be familiar with, and we've been linking that up with the new, uh, with the new uh, Mini X, if you will, for the uh, uh, IP instructor pilot specific uh, warrant officer advanced course. So again, we can't expect people to know how to use these tools if we never teach them, and that's part of our mission at the uh, aviation school that we've been uh, working on recently. Uh, above and beyond that, uh, my observation within the aviation world, we're very focused on RL progression. We're experts at that. We have instructor pilots that do that for a living. So we're great at teaching individual skills, uh, and we leverage simulations to do that uh, to a large extent. We're, we're good at crew training, um, which we largely do in live aircraft, but less so in the collective aspect of uh, doing collective training, which we know AVCAT could be leveraged to do more, but 
some people may be familiar, unfamiliar with the fact that we can use AVCA as our tool to link out to the rest of the combined armed force, whether it's a close combat tactical trainer for tank and Bradleys for your counterparts, dismounted soldier training system for dismounted infantry, uh, RVTT, uh, reconfigurable virtual tactical trainer, tanks and Bradleys, or sorry, uh, uh, Humvees and Hemets. So you have a way to interface beyond the aviation force to your combined arm forces at your home station if, you're, if you leverage those tools and link them up. In addition, uh, especially once you get up to the battalion level, you have a, a responsibility to train your staff, which is often neglected, I think. Uh, the only way that's gonna happen is if the commander has a vision, establishes train objectives, and lays out a, a process. Uh, you, you asked me to talk about TADS. One of the problems we have as simulation planners or as exercise planners is we have a really hard time getting a clear vision of what the commander wants and what his training objectives are. What we usually get are these are the TADS I want to use, and we never hardly get the training objectives until we sort of help them invent them often after the fact. So as, as the commanders, you've got to provide the vision uh, and get the right people involved so that the simulation guys and the TADS experts, both at your, uh, at your uh, Mission Command Training Center or your M MTC and your Training Support Center can bring the support they need to help you uh, create your vision, bring your vision I I into, uh, into reality. Okay, okay. I, you know, of course we're finding ourselves going back to the commander, you know, and, and I'll talk more about that, I think, later. Uh, it, it, if time lends itself. You know, you know, Colonel Vazari, if you could talk about some of the ways that you see reserve component units. So you see all of the mobilizing reserve component aviation units that are coming through Division West and Fort Hood, Texas, uh, under your purview, at least for yes. some period of time. Could, could you maybe expand it so that we're not just focused on the singular component about some right. of the topics we may talk about? So, so we have two missions. It's post-mobilization and pre-mobilization. Post-mobilization is a unit gets notified that they're going to go to a theater of operation and they would come to Fort Hood all the way to from, from platoon level all the way up to brigade level. Uh, we, we validate that they're ready to go to the theater. And then the pre-mobilization is that they have a mission, they just don't know what, and they're kind of standing in the door getting ready to do something. That's the evolving one that we're working on right now uh, as, as patch charts kind of disappear and, and less and less units are deploying. So for focusing on pre-mobilization, uh, a National Guard unit could be comprised of 10 different states. The one that we're sending to, uh, to Kuwait from 10 different states, multi-compo. U.S. Army Reserve, National Guard, seven different states, and then an active duty unit. It's all part of one force. So they meet each other for the very first time sometimes uh, when they come to Fort Hood. That makes things very difficult for the leader. Uh, from, so the, the many different states come together, uh, they can't train prior to coming to us, so things happen very quickly that they have to learn what they're doing. So our job is to kind of the crawl, walk, run phase, if you will, to getting up to that phase where if it's at a cab level, that we, we leverage the, the AVCATs. The AVCATs talk to their, uh, to their sheepoffs so that they can actually, we can replicate what life is going to be like for them in theater. So as the, the, the challenge is, is, we've been fighting in teams of two. Uh, so when we want to do something like a major air assault, We've lost the skill set of a combined arms rehearsal. We've lost the uh, air assault planning process type stuff when we're talking at major level. So you're talking about 10 different entities coming together. So the best way to do that is through the simulation. Uh, we can work some live, virtual, and constructive all in one shot, and we can redo it, do it all over again. It doesn't cost anything. It just costs electricity to get the machine working. And uh, we have the subject matter experts coming around and work with that cab to make sure that they, they learn what right looks like, and then we give them a chance to do it. Um, and with all different types of weather, if it's day, night, or working with partners, we'll even replicate having a, a foreign NC. I think even MCO, you helped us fly with a couple of units uh, from Dutch doing some multi-ship operations, or I mean multi-nation uh, multi operations. But the, the big thing that we, that Sergeant Major Vila is up here with me is my uh, Brigade Sergeant Major. Um, the leader development aspect from a, from a National Guardman, sometimes he's a full-timer, and that's what he knows. But when he mobilizes, he's the first sergeant. The comfort zone of that guy, he goes right back to turning that wrench where he needs to be the first sergeant. So we got to break them of their habit of being a maintenance tech and being that leader. Um, not everybody is a full timer, so we have to get guys adjusted. It's kind of ironic to see Captain Wheeler in front of me. He happens to be one of those guys. 
Uh, in his particular case, he was put into command a couple days before deploying because of uh, we had to move out uh, a company commander who didn't quite get it. Captain Wheeler got thrown into the mix and deployed a couple days later. Uh, it's very challenging to, to be put in that situation because you didn't, when you're on the active duty side, you grow up. You, you, you grow up side by side by side, and you're, you're working together. Sometimes you get some last minute guys in right before deployment, but literally these guys are put together very, very quickly, and then 60 days later they're, they're going to a, a theater. So it makes things very, very challenging. Good. You know, you know I might ask, and, and then Colonel Klein, if, if I might, if you could maybe participate here in a second, you know, because uh, because I may get different answers here. What what percentage of the training that you do to mobilizing units involves simulation or TADS? S simulation in particular. I'd say at the cab level. Yep, at the cab level. At the cab level, the ATX, the aviation training side, is is the culminating training event. Uh, but at the actual uh, the company level. Uh, we're we're going to focus more on the live as much as possible, and then we don't do as much uh, of the uh, collective aspect of it. But at the cab level, for sure, a, 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 I'd say more than 50 percent, because that's the true time. True time, you get to see everybody. So more than 50 percent. So it, it's a major. We know it's a major investment. We know it's a major investment, and we know as we as leaders in our operational army are going to have to master the art of maximizing simulation use in the simulators and, and, and those types of devices army wide. Um, I, I might ask from the JRTC, you know, so how much, maybe a percentage, so we, we heard one number, let, and, and then we're going to go to an active cab commander here shortly, but what, how, talk to us about the, the sim, simulations and, and where it fits into our uh, reality at the training centers now. Well, so, I, so and please tell us what you do there at JRTC. My name is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Guy Garrett. I'm the 5th Aviation Battalion Commander there. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Neil Riley is actually the Alpha 6, uh, who is the senior OC for aviation. He couldn't be here today, so I'll, I'll try to talk to the best I can. Uh, I will say from my perspective, um, it, it was similar they, at the brigade level. Um, I had to give a percentage in just what I know that, that goes on. I would say it's, some, it's less than 50%. I'd say it's about... 30, 40 percent of what's done at the CTC is Call it a third? Call it a third? About a third, yes, sir. Because at that point, um, a lot of the training has already been conducted. Uh, the simulation training has been conducted. So you're, it's more live that's, that's uh, being done at the CTCs now. I know there has been a move to uh, attempt to do larger than brigade size uh, training exercises. It will be uh, live, virtual, and constructive uh, training events. Uh, but we haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, so that's on the horizon for us. OK, thank you very much. And, and then, you know, Colonel Klein, I know, you, you know, one of the points of pride that we discussed in our initial office call is DES was coming to visit your unit over the last couple of weeks, was your work with the AVCAT in training Army leaders. Uh, might you talk about that potentially as a best practice? Uh, and I, that, I'm sure that'd be appreciated and contribute to the conversation we're having this afternoon. I don't, I don't know if we're doing anything that uh, others haven't done, but uh, we've got about 36 aircraft that we maintain and reset. So just because of availability of resources, uh, we really had to look hard at our simulation systems. And that wasn't just AVCAD, it was uh, the mission training complex that's there at Fort Stewart and the integration with AVCAT with that and CCTT and, and all that all that's, that's uh, available for that. And uh, going back to something that General Lundy said is that, uh, it, you know, you hear all these acronyms and all these facilities that are available, but until you start to walk individuals through what these facilities can do for you, you're you're just you're missing a, a major building block. So they've got to go in. You got to take these young company commanders in there. You got to take these folks in there. They actually got to see. Got to have some of these civilian folks kind of explain what the capabilities are available, and then you can move out from there. So don't don't skip that critical building block. But one of the things we learned is we were transitioning from. Uh, exclusively a coin fight to the uh, to the date environment mm -hmm. was uh, you know we got, we got a lot of H-64 pilots for example that are very comfortable flying at higher altitudes and slow and and uh, haven't employed more than two 64s at a shot anymore now now hey what do you do when you're out at NTC or JRTC and you crest that hill and you come across a uh, you know a dug in platoon or a company of T-80s what are you gonna do how are you gonna figure out that engagement and so uh, we use the AVCAT uh, quite a bit for that. And so a lot of collective training in terms of uh, different flight mission profile, um, use of the FCR, which we just recently started reinstalling on the aircraft. A lot of aviators haven't seen that in a while. 
And, you know, obviously a phenomenal training environment for young platoon leaders and company commanders to lead their formations and making it a requirement for your AMC program. You know, battalion commanders have a lot of vote in that, and so do the companies in terms of developing these individuals, but you want to get after a multiple MDS uh, uh, scenario that is fairly high intensity, you run them through an AVCAT scenario, but before you get to that graduate level task where there are multiple different aircraft types, an enemy set that is uh, fairly rigorous, uh, an environment that is very challenging, you, you got that there's a building block with that as well. So we kind of, we built three series of scenarios, uh, call it an A, a B, and a C. An A may be just a young aviator that's going in there and it may be an ASC lane, for example. What's he going to do when he encounters SA-18s and ZSU-23-4s, ZSU and how is he going to react to those? And after he gets a certain level of proficiency at that, you start to move him up. Uh, so that's one of the things we're doing in AVCAT. We've got a very high utilization rate because I don't have a whole lot of airplanes that are on the ramp. And uh, hopefully that's helpful for you. Well, th thank you. Sir. All right, so we, we heard from JRTC. I was Alpha 6, so I'm going I'm to talk about the CTCs. In my previous life, just recently, I managed the CTC program. All right, so we, we talked about that. John talked a little bit about what he's able to do in simulations that he can't do live. So let's, let's the CTCs are our premier training venue, true or false? True. I mean, anybody argue that point? Okay, that's, that's kind of what we hang our hat on. That's, that's the A game. What makes our CTC special? Is it because they're really, really big and they have a lot of land? Not JRTC and not JMRC. They're pretty small postage stamps that are out there. Okay, NTC is a big place. So what makes them special? Well, it's our professional OCs, true. It's our professional op four, true. But I would tell you, it's the fidelity of the environment that you create there. That's really what makes them unique, okay? Just think about that. So we've got OCs that are equipped with the capability to do some very good AARs. They can capture what happens there. I would tell you, at home station, you have that same capability. Those are TADs. When we talk about training aids, devices, simulations, and simulators, Okay, this is where we really need to think about how do we bring what we want to be able to do at home station is train the way we fight, right? So if you're training at home station and you've got you know your three five platoon out there or your distro company out there training, are they using miles? I would tell you that what I'm finding is that's not happening. You can look at our miles utilization rates. So are we creating? I mean, we use miles at the CTC so we can get pairing between you know enemy and friendly, so we can see fratricide, so we can get battlefield effects. Okay, we can do that at home station, but we're not. This is where we got to talk to our leaders about how do you bring the fidelity of your training up? John talked about using AVCAT to be able to face these threats that are out there, and, th and that is a way to do it, but also in the live environment, I would tell you that about 80%, matter of fact, 100% of what happens at a CTC is supported by TADs. All the battlefield effects that are out there, whether it's an IED simulator, whether it's miles, whether it's instrumentation, that's all TADs, and all of that is at home station right now. It's at every home station. It's not out at your guard armories, but it's at any of your regional training complexes and all of our major force comm installations. I would tell you that 100% of a JRTC and an NTC rotation has a constructive wrap around it. So the peripheral units that are outside the boundaries are replicated, so you can do artillery fires in and out, other things like that. There's a lot of stuff done in constructive sims to drive the complexity of mission command. That's at home station, and you can use that. It's called the Jalectic. So the point is, is really trying to get after and figure out how do we bring the fidelity of our training up to where we can get quality, train the way we fight, and that, that really gets down to making sure that a lot of our leaders understand all of these capabilities and how to employ them, and how do we plan and execute. And then being able to deliver a quality AR, you have all those tools out there. there are, you can go through the HITS, Home Station Instrumentation System. It'll replay everything that you did in that 20K by 20K box. So you can go back and AAR it and talk about, you know, cause and effect. So, and then linking the virtual simulations in, call for fire trainers, AVCAT, CCTT, RVTT, all of those come into play. Um, so there, there's a lot out there, and I think that's a key component that we've got to get to to drive home. And while we're tying a lot of our... Uh, simulation exercise, other exercises we're doing in PME right now. Our NCOs are doing it now, um, so they can get exposed to these capabilities. And we're and we're getting away from having unique USACE solutions. We want to have solutions that you have at home station. So, oh, sir, sir, go ahead. just a quick alibi. FA 57s. Every cab's got one. I don't. Is it the same in the guard? Do you have, or, or I mean, any of the National Guard component? 
Yeah, 57s. We have for years bastardized FA-57s, and you, you know, they become the night battle major or something like that. Let me tell you, I, I'm very fortunate. I've got an FA-57 that is a rock star. John Culpepper is his name. He ranks in top five of my majors across the formation. He is very good. But he's good because he's very aggressive about it, and he thinks like a three, he thinks like a two. He's plugged in with the ground forces out there. He understands all the systems. Uh, he plugs into Fort Rucker, Wade Becknell down here. He, he plugs into T-Bock. And uh, so I would encourage you, if you have an F-57, to sit down with that individual and find out what it is that they can do and empower them to go get after it. Because they made a, we did something that was uh, in preparation for one of our task forces going, uh, got the GRF mission going on. And he built a, we try to replicate an ATX the best we could uh, with the CCTT and the AVCATs. Uh, Infantry Brothers were online, HICON that's in there, UAVs flying, the whole, everything that we used to see in the, in the uh, ATX and then a little bit more. But that's because you got an FA-57 that uh, can get after it. So I just be careful about where you position those folks. Thank you. Thanks. Just, just go, one go quick ahead. follow on to both of you guys. So the, there will be a FA-57 and then First Army. First Army's mission as we go towards the pre-mob will be just what you talked about. It's a, it's a War X, it's a CSTX, and for the National Guard, it's an XCTC. So if you can't make it to NTC or JRTC, they're having exercises at Hunter Liggett, at Gowan Field and also at Fort McCoy where all these units and some of these aviation units are getting get invited. They're, they're, they may just be due to proximity, but it's not our for gen base. But all of that General Tucker's, it wants miles on every vehicle. It wants a living, breathing, thinkable op for that's on the battlefield out there. So you're going to get a chance to get that experience. So for any of the Guard Reserve guys that are out there that have an opportunity to participate, when you're going to see the A patch walking around at OCT and be able to provide you that same stuff that you talked about, sir. Okay, great, thank you. You know, I, I was privy to an exam this week about cross-COE training, uh, which I think will translate well to developing leaders. Could, could Steve, maybe you talk about that. I, I think you wrote that exam this week to talk. Okay. And, and, and tell us what we just did recently between the, the centers of excellence. Uh, okay. Go ahead, you got it. Uh, I'll talk about that. I'd, I'd like to drive home a couple of points that were just, making, were just made, though. Um, one is I, I'm, I'm a functional Air 57 myself, aviation background, uh, FA-57. I have several that work for me. I know most of the FA, or a lot of the FA-57s, at least all the senior ones. But if you have any questions about what they can do for you, uh, get with me afterwards and I can uh, elaborate. Um, the, I was going to make the same comment on the CTCs. The, to, to a Sims guy, live virtual, constructive, and gaming, LVCG, L means live instrumented to us, and it, at the uh, CTCs, uh, generally the forces are instrumented the, the whole time. Uh, the other one I mentioned, the things that you could link into with your AVCAT, I forgot to mention HITS, Home Station Instrumentation uh, Systems. Joe, Joe Lundy uh, mentioned that, but that's the live uh, instrumented component as well. Uh, also, before I transition over to, to your point, uh, the aviation training exercises were the big thing at Fort Rucker, dating all the way back to uh, Bosnia. Uh, we've recently stopped doing those after uh, 90 iterations. But uh, one of the products you should be aware of is that uh, our, our guys that, that put those together help create is the CPXF, which is a, uh, a CPX functional, CPX functional, but it's a, it's a product that's already out there that's it's a semi-planned exercise, I guess you would say. All of the, uh, the terrain, the, the uh, stimulation for the CPOF systems, it's NTC terrain um, overlaid with the date scenario. So it's, it's somewhat of a prepackaged exercise. Of course, it's going to have to be tailored to your unit's training objectives and what level of your training audience is, and that's where you can leverage your your FA-57s and your uh, local facilities, your train sports center for your AVCAT, and your uh, MTC for your other simulation support, and your mission command system uh, stimulation. It's really LVCG and the MC, is what I like to say, mission command systems. If you're training the staff, their weapon system is their mission command systems. So if you're not stimulating those somehow during the exercise, they're not probably getting good training. Um, so back to uh, uh, the point about the inner COE events, we're leveraging some technology right now to do that we just did last week to, to link to Fort Benning from Fort Rucker. We linked our 
RV, or RCTDs, which are essentially your AVCATs, older generation AVCATs that we have uh, uh, several of, uh, to the Virtual Battle Space 2 simulation that they have at Fort Benning. Uh, how's that translate to you at home station? Same way it will transfer to us in, in the near future, which is our AVCATs can link to VBS-3. Virtual Battle Space 3 was just released. Uh, we're waiting on a, uh, a patch to come out of it before we start using it in June, but it is the Army's system of record for gaming. Within the aviation community, We've been sort of slow to adapt to using gaming technology, largely because we're used to multi-million dollar simulators being at our uh, beck and call. Uh, but uh, what, what the VBS-2 can do is give you a, mass, a massive uh, way to interact with your other service components in a, very, uh, dynamic, in a very dynamic manner. The other point I wanted to make with your AVCAT, a lot of the reason that AVCAT has a bad reputation in the community is because people try to do the same thing they do for a flight simulator. You show up your, for your flight period and say, what are we going to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? That's the wrong answer if you're doing collective training in AVCAT. You've got to invest the time and effort to come up with a collective training plan in order to get something out of it. Otherwise, it's, it's going to be useless to you because uh, it's not the same fidelity as your individual training platforms. That's not what they're there for. But, uh, just like, you could, just like we can link between distant locations to the other CTCs, you can link across posts to your counterparts using uh, the gaming technology or uh, uh, virtual technology. And uh, again, as the live virtual and constructive integrating architecture comes around each post, it's been fielded, I think, to seven posts now, you'll also be able to link into uh, your home station instrumentation system for your ground forces in particular. That's excellent. That's, you know, thank you very much. You know, in the final 10 minutes or so here, before we break and then move to the other deep dives, you, you know, all of us you know, are a product of our training. You know, you know, we're a product of our family values and we're a, priority, a product of our experiences and our Army ethos, but we've been trained. All of us have been trained and developed, all of us. And we, we know what right training looks like. So, you know, just broadly, I'm interested, each one of us here, Joe, how are you? Welcome. Is, we, we, I, I can remember my formative experience on the road to becoming what I hope is, is an adaptive and resilient leader. And I, I'm just asking that maybe some of you share that idea. So what is quality Re leader development training look like at potentially low cost and low investment? You know, we've all heard of outstanding programs. It, it, it could be leadership at the combat training center. It could be something you did at home station. It could be attendance at the United States Army's Ranger School. You know, those types of things that develop leaders that we are familiar with. Um, and, and any thoughts? What? Colonel Klein? Let's hear from somebody else. Colonel Baker? John, John yeah. I mean, is it, is it, you know, is it experiential? Is, is the name of the game experiential? Is it education? Is it a combination of all those things? You know, we, we, we're going to have to start deciding these things to, to some degree uh, and, and prioritize them over others. So is it wet? Is it cold? Is it demanding? Is it at home station? Is it at the combat training centers? You know, how do we develop adaptive and resilient leaders? And, and any, any thoughts on that? Go, take, take a shot, sir. All right, well, let's think about time spent. Okay, time how, much, spent. how much time does a soldier spend in PME over, over a span of a career? How much time did you spend in professional military education, percentage-wise of your time in the Army? 15%? Okay, that's probably about right, about 15%. Now, unlike me, who has about 75 CTC rotations with three years at NTC and some time at JMRC and at, at uh, JRTC, I mean, how, how much time do you spend at a CTC? 
I've know, been once. I've been once, sir. Okay. So I've been once. We've got some that have been a few times, some that have been 10, you know, some that spent time out there, but let's say it's only about 5%. So there's 20% right there. Where's the rest of it spent? It's with commanders. It's with, with brigade and battalion commanders, company commanders. So it is experiential. It is in the operational army. That's, that's where it's got to be. We can't fix it. We can help enable it through the CTCs. The CTCs can really serve. They kind of, they, they're kind of like DES. I mean, they do serve as a forcing function to force you to drive into, you know, much more rigor and realism at home station. I mean, that's a catalyst for you to do that. It's kind of like deploying. You know, deploying is a catalyst. DES is a catalyst for you to make sure that your records are all straight. Who will? Mr. Drews. Cool. But, and you actually can pass five and nine. So, but, but what's the catalyst in the operational army at home station? What is that catalyst for how you develop leaders? I would argue it's commander-centric, right? I mean, that's what our doctrine says. So 7-0 says it's commanders. And I'm not putting the weight on the commanders, but the weight is there. That's in your ruck. So how do you get after that? I mean, kind of words and deeds when we think about things. I mean, if training and leader development is important to your organization, it's important to you, then what are your words and deeds? What, what do you accept for what was the first developmental thing that you as a young leader, what was the first thing you probably got stuck with as a lieutenant? Step okay, lead. somebody said a range. Absolutely. Range. Okay, and how well prepared were you for that range? You were basically said, here, here's your white paddle. Go out there and figure it out. And it was pretty ugly. And there was probably a company commander and a first sergeant back there with their arms crossed going, yeah, this doesn't look too good, but I'm not sure what I need to do to fix it because they had the same experience and didn't have anybody out there mentoring them and coaching them on what right it looks like. So how do you fix that? You know, you've got to train and certify your leaders. So never inflict an untrained leader on your soldiers. That's absolutely the worst thing because, you know, if mission command is truly going to be realized, I mean, there's two components of mission command that we've got to get to. It's shared understanding and it's trust, okay? And it, it really gets, if you've got shared understanding, you've got trust, you know where to set the left and the right limit. For a young lieutenant, a young warrant officer, we do this with our PCs, how much, you know, how... How far are we going to let them go? How much rope are we going to give them? Where are we going to position somebody? Who do we need to position in place to be able to make the diving catch? And so as we think about how we train and how we certify our leaders, you know, we don't want to break that trust with our soldiers either because if we put an untrained sergeant out there, an untrained W-2, I mean, we would never turn around and look at W-1 Drews and say, go give the brigade SP a check ride, would we? But why would we ever take a second lieutenant and tell him to go out and train the battalion or the company you know, on a small arms range. So it kind of gets the words and deeds. Now, would we train them and prepare them to do that and then let them loose? Absolutely. So we got to think about that. I mean, when, what, what is your time as a commander, as a senior warrant officer, as a senior non-commissioned officer, where are you investing your time to prepare your leaders to train your soldiers? Because that's, that's really what the commanders need to be doing. And it's for everything that we're doing. It's for everything from physical fitness to small arms, you know, and, and then think about what it is that we want to get out of it. You know, a lot of people talk about shoot, move, and communicate, you know, kind of the building block fundamentals. But I would tell you the pieces when we think about words and deeds as I go out there and see them, you know, do we accept that sharpshooter is appropriate? Is it shoot and hit what we're supposed to hit? Okay, I mean, that, that's, that's a different way of looking at shoot, okay? You know, communicate to understand. That's different than just being able to push to talk. You know, and it's maneuver to a position of advantage. If you think about that, that drives towards the art piece. And I tell you, the people that have the experience to do that are not the lieutenants, not the captains, not the sergeants. It's the W-4s, it's the W-5s, it's the majors, it's the lieutenant colonels, it's the colonels. That's what we need to drive because guess what? When you leave the formation, who's going to pick up that mantle? So that's, I need you all to think about that. That's what we need to think about. You know, how do we get after it? You know, we can beat it in PME and PCC, but really, so what tools do we need to provide you out of the institution? That's what I need you coming back and telling me as the proponent. What do you need from us to help you? Training support packages, we've talked about that. You know, we've talked a lot about the ATX going away, but it really didn't go away. MCTP is now doing full-blown exercises to where you go in as a cab and you participate, and it's no longer, you're not a response cell. Don't think about MCTP as a part of the MRXs. Totally different thing. You're going to have an OC package on you, and you're going to perform as a brigade command post operating your forces. 
And then we're doing an ATX variant out there with the uh, 166, and then we're training task forces out at the CTCs. So we're still getting after that piece, but what, what are the tools that you need at home station? Those are the things, and then the tools that you do have, are they delivering what you want? If they're not, you need to talk about that, your USR and other things like that, because we gotta drive a demand signal. Because I would tell you, everything related to TSS and training and leader development is under pressure in the budget. So if you got simulations out there that aren't current, which we have problems with, you need to articulate that. If you got simulations that won't talk to each other, you need to articulate that. If you need a range out there, you don't have a dagger and you need a dagger, you need to articulate that. So spend some time thinking about this and with your leaders. Um, that was kind of the purpose of today was just kind of have a, a little bit of a discussion and feed some of the, the fire. But I would tell you that a commander who's passionate about training and leader development lines up the words and deeds and really thinks about, okay, it's more than talk. It's really about what, what, what part of my time am I taking to develop my subordinate leaders? And how am I doing that? How am I, in fact, doing that is what you really need to think about, you need to wrestle with at whatever echelon you're at, whether it's at the company level, brigade level, the center level. Oh, so Thank I you, think sir. we're about out of time. We, we are, sir. That would but I could go on forever, and I apologize for that. So, no. But... Cool. Sir, we pre we, I, I appreciate everybody's participation. No, th thank we you. needed more, but that's okay. Those that didn't speak do push-ups cool. to standard. You know, so we have 10 minutes until the next two deep dives. Thanks again to Quad A. Thanks again for your attendance and participation as we begin to, con to you know, forge a continued way ahead with TADS and all our components training resilient and adaptive leaders. Okay, thank you. Thank you, team.